Testing one, two. And we're live. What's up, guys? Welcome back to a Fish the Moment live stream. I'm really excited to talk to you guys about some offshore winter fishing today. And again, if you guys are checking out my videos for the first time, this is my live stream format. And I'm going to be talking to my subscribers live, breaking down lakes with Navionics, Google, or stuff like that. So if you're here for that and you're interested in that, stay, watch the stream, click the little uh, chat. If you're watching this video back on YouTube, you can see all the people commenting. There's a little button on the bottom of the screen there right beneath the video but if this is your first time watching my videos I would recommend going back to my channel and actually watching some of my normal video formats I do a lot of instructional videos with graphs with Navionics I actually fish in those videos and I'm on the lake catching some good bass so check out those videos if you haven't seen any of them before but for those of you guys who are here for the live stream welcome back I got a bunch of people on already what's up all the regulars here we got Clint and James Caleb Dean JT, Mike, Dan, Roger, good to see everybody uh, here tonight from the Edge to the Ledge. Uh, Josh, Kyle, uh, Jerry, all these guys are awesome. Uh, always here on the stream, always supporting the channel. So 79 people on already, that is awesome. So anyways, guys, what I'm going to be doing today is breaking down three lakes from my Patreon subscribers. Uh, if you want to have your lake checked out in the stream, go to my Patreon page. It's, oh, I always get that wrong. It's over here, uh, bottom right corner of the screen. And uh, you can go there and you can join the $5 tier and I'll be looking at subscribers, Patreon subscribers lakes in my live stream every single week. And so check those out. Uh, if you want that, you can also get lake breakdowns and personal fishing lessons with me when they come available. They're sold out right now, but they will be available in the near future. And so uh, other than that, want to jump right into the video. And for this actual video here, I decided to pick three lakes that I'm pretty familiar with so that I can make some good recommendations based on experience and kind of what I know. I didn't want to do any uh, lakes from my subscribers on offshore fishing that hadn't actually gone and caught fish offshore on or seen pros catch fish offshore on. I want to make sure I'm making some educated uh, guesses, I guess, for the spot that I think these fish are going to be on. Obviously, all the spots I check out on my stream are places I would go check out and I think have a high probability of holding fish, but they're not always foolproof every year. So with all that said, let's jump right into the first lake, which is Lake Washita in Arkansas. And I know that I have a lot of people from Arkansas tuning in, and there are a ton of people who uh, want me to do Arkansas lakes, and that's where I'm based out of is Arkansas. So I'm actually doing uh, Lake Washita, which is in central Arkansas. Then we're looking at Table Rock Lake in Missouri, which is on the Arkansas-Missouri border. Then we're switching over to Lake Hartwell in Georgia, and all three of those are really good offshore fisheries in the wintertime. So uh, first up... Lake Washita is one of my favorite lakes ever. It is one of the most diverse fisheries. The Forestwood Cup is held there uh, multiple times. There's a ton of FLW events that have been held out here over the years. The Forestwood Cup was actually there last year. And this lake is really cool. Let me switch actually over to Google Earth for you guys and show you what this lake looks like on Google Earth just to give you an idea of how it's laid out. So if we take a look here, the midsection of the lake here is where a lot of tournaments come out of, and there's also some tournaments that come out of this boat ramp over here, Brady Mountain. And the mid lake is uh, pretty deep, pretty clear, maybe has 100 feet of water out here in the middle, and there's standing timber. Um, there's some, some grass on this part of the lake, though. This year, it's, the lake's really high, which killed some of the grass. I was actually out there a couple weeks ago. And uh, a lot of the fish like to get offshore here because it's really deep, and it's actually really deep all throughout this lake. And up on this side of the lake, on the east side of the lake, there's a lot of grass and offshore grass, which is also good for offshore fishing, which we'll talk about. But the one thing with Washita is that, or any lake that has grass for that matter, that grass will keep fish shallower in the winter. So instead of getting out in 30, 40, 50 feet of water, they might only be in 10 to 15 or maybe 20 feet because of that grass. And then up the river, you have some dirtier water uh, ledge areas, and there's also some fish that sit out here. They just sit a little bit shallower in the wintertime. So I'm going to run through 
all the different areas where I like to fish in the winter and where I've caught them on Lake Washita for offshore bass. So for anyone who's fishing Washita, hopefully you'll be able to find some uh, good new spots from this. And then for everyone else, uh, hopefully you'll be able to learn something. So let me switch back over to Navionics here really quick, and then we'll jump right into it. And let me focus mainly on Navionics tonight, guys, just for the fact that we're looking at offshore fishing, and really it's hard to find those offshore spots without the Navionics maps. And if you don't know how to read these contour line maps, I'll recommend checking out one of my videos on my channel. Uh, it's called uh, Complete Guide to Contour Line Maps or Topo Maps, something like that. And it'll explain what all of these maps are telling you and all the good structures to look for. So... Right here, this is the main area where a lot of tournaments take out of Crystal Springs. And there's a lot of fish that get released out in here. And people catch fish back in here all the time. There used to be a really good grass line that was in the back of this creek right in front of the boat ramp. And here's a boat ramp right here. And if you look at this, there's actually a nice little ledge. And there's a little indent that pops in right here. I've caught multiple five-pounders off that little point right there. There's a brush pile right off that spot. A lot of fish get released here from a tournament. And they'll pull right out here offshore. And they'll sit there all winter long, all the way up to the pre-spawn into March. And when I'm talking winter fishing, guys, I'm talking about water temperatures that are probably below 50 degree range, 55 degrees. When the water temperatures drop below 55... I think I go into winter fishing, and then I normally think that the fish get into that pre-spawn mode when the water temperatures warm back up over 50 degrees. Now, that can change for lakes. I know a lot of guys out there have fish on lakes where the water temperatures never get below 50 degrees, and there's other guys who have ice on the lakes right now. So the water temperatures are kind of hard to guess. A lot of guys are like, oh, tell me exactly the water temperatures you use. Well, that doesn't really apply across all lakes in all regions of the country. But anyways, that's a nice little spot right there. It's way back in the back of a creek, but you have a nice, again, little ledge with a little turn right here. And that little turn or that point that sticks out, there used to be a bunch of grass out here. And when that grass died, uh, there's just some brush out here, and that's all those fish relate to. This used to be a honey hole. Then as you work your way out, kind of the main theme for offshore bass fishing in the wintertime is to find places where the creek channel runs up against a main lake flat or a main lake point or a main lake hump. Any type of structure, but it needs to be deep structure. It's not going to be a uh, structure in shallow water. And shallow water is very relative to whatever lake you're on. So if you look at Lake Washita here, you can see in the middle of the creek here, it's 93 feet of water. And so on lakes where you have a 90 to 100 feet of water, those bass a lot of times will get out and suspend, which means that they're sitting, if the bottom's right here, they'll sit above the bottom, between the surface of the water and the bottom, and they'll sit, and a lot of times they'll sit over 50 or 60 feet of water, maybe even 70 feet of water, and suspend over trees or over brush piles or grass or anything like that, and they'll suspend in 20 to 30, maybe even 40 feet of water. So they'll get really deep. And sometimes on Table Rock, we'll look at in a second, those fish can get as deep as 70 feet of water, and I know some guys are catching them out there that deep right now. And so on Washita, what basically I'm looking for is I'm looking for any place where a creek channel, and a creek channel is basically any place where you see this white area next run up to a blue area. And you want to find areas where there's a nice sharp drop. And a sharp drop on a contour line map is any place where you see these lines get really close together. So it's almost like a black area. So if you look right here, you have a nice drop. This is 24 feet of water. There's actually standing timber up on this point, and it drops off really quickly into 80 to 90 feet of water. This point right here is always really good in the wintertime. And another point right here on the opposite side, again, a creek channel runs right by it, and another creek channel swings in here, forming a really nice point that's surrounded by two creek channels and this point right here is really deep 20 30 40 feet of water and sometimes in when it's cloudy outside or when you get a lot of wind or first thing in the morning these fish in the winter time offshore like to pull up on top of this offshore structure so on top of these points or on top of these humps uh, up on top here and that 20 foot of water especially on Washita, they love to get up shallow first thing in the morning or on cloudy days but then if you get a sunny day and there's no wind, or you're fishing in the middle of the day and it's bright, sunny, no wind, those fish like to pull off the top of these spots and they'll suspend out over this creek channel, over the top of 60, 70, 80 feet of water. Sometimes they might even sit like down closer in 40 feet of water, 50 feet of water, and they might sit 
on the bottom or just suspended off the bottom, but they're not going to be up on top of these little humps or points. They're going to be off the drop sitting out here. And guys normally catch those fish on uh, jigging spoons. You might throw an underspin, like a little swim bait, a drop shot, stuff like that on those fish that suspend out here. And then when you have those, the wind, it'll push those fish further up on these little points or if you have overcast conditions or it's first thing in the morning. And a lot of guys will catch fish out here with a uh, really good, uh, with like an umbrella rig. They'll throw an umbrella rig down there. They'll fish a football jig, a Carolina rig, stuff like that. Awesome. Bruce Clayton with a $50 uh, super chat. Thank you so much, man. He says, we'll watch later. Want to support this awesome content in your work. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Really appreciate the super chat. That's amazing. Um, so, uh, you know, guys, thank you so much for all the support too. Um, I am really just shocked at how much uh, support I'm getting on Patreon through these live streams, and it's been amazing. I have 211 people watching right now. The channel's been exploding lately. I'm getting like 100 to 200 subscribers a day, getting tons of video views. I'm trying to put out content twice a week while working full-time, so I'm really busting my butt trying to uh, get content out for you guys, but I'm loving it. And so I just want to thank you all for the support, and anything you guys can do to uh, share the videos out with your friends, I really appreciate it. It helps grow as a channel, and it helps me... Um, just make more content and, you know, gets me closer to uh, potential goals in the future. So don't want to get into that too much. But anyways, um, this is a uh, live stream, not uh, me thanking everyone. So let me get back to this, but I did want to put that out there. So anyways, um, so those are a couple spots right here that look really good. Um, another thing that you can actually do, just kind of uh, checking some of these spots out, if you look, like here's a nice little point here I catch some fish on. Again, that creek channel swings in here, and it swings around this corner, and you can catch some fish up on this point. And normally the best places I find in the wintertime are places where you have a nice flatter spot up on top or like a high spot on top of a point because these are really good feeding areas. So you can see here this little hump right here, this little point comes up and it actually gets a little bit deeper. There's a saddle then it comes back up to shallower water and there's a little rocky spot up here with some brush and that's why it's really good. Same thing here. These contour lines get really spread out. But like a point like this, if you look at this point, there's fish that sometimes pull up on this uh, but if you look at it, it's not really that defined. All the contour lines are just really close together all the way up to the top of the point. So there's no flat spot for those fish to feed on. Here, there's a really good, almost like a, a dinner table for these fish to feed on when you get on this spot right here, because you can see those contour lines spread out. That means it gets flatter up on top and they can push that bait up on that flat spot. Not so much here. Another thing these fish will do in the wintertime is once they've get off these points, especially uh, when you're fishing on a sunny day or if there's no wind, they might pull off in the middle of these creeks or these pockets and they'll just suspend out here in the middle. And what you have to do is just graph around and look for fish on your graph. And that's how a lot of these spots are. What you have to do is just graph until you see fish on your electronics and it's a process of just graphing for hours and hours and hours. It's so painful sometimes. But when you find a school of fish, you'll know it. So a lot of times people are like, okay, what am I looking for on my graph? When you see a school of fish, it's going to be dots all over the screen, bait everywhere. It's just going to explode your graph, and you'll know that there's fish down there. Normally, when I'm fishing in the wintertime and I just see isolated fish, sometimes I can catch them, but a lot of times it's not worth my time. And I'd rather just keep graphing and looking for those mega schools, especially in the wintertime, because a lot of times those good fish will, uh, or those, the fish will group up and you can find like really good limit holes and just catch a bunch of keepers. Um, one thing I will say though is some of those spots that have just a few fish on them have bigger fish. So kind of have to play it by ear. But uh, another spot that I like right here where you have this creek channel swinging in, you have a nice little point right here comes up to a little hump there's actually some grass up on this or there was so those fish would sit right off of this in some grass next to some standing timber i fish a football jig down there and crush them also throw an a rig off of this too and catch them and then this little gut right here sometimes has some fish too so all kinds of spots i mean you kind of just go down this bank and kind of see okay here's a 40 foot point creek channel swings up right against it another creek channel swings in here flat spot up on top that's money and you know you got another little saddle right here, and there's a point right here and a point right here. Sometimes fish pull up on that. And you might wonder, okay, how do I know if, you know, fish pull up on this point or this point or this point? They all look good. Well, that's where your electronics come in. You have to just graph, look for them, try to find them with your electronics. Once you graph over those spots, you'll be able to know if there's fish there. And it's weird because, like, some years I'll find fish on this point and they'll be loaded. And then the next year I'll come back and I won't catch anything there. But then the next summer or the next winter they'll be on this point. Or maybe this little 
little spot will be really good because the water's a little bit higher and those fish have pushed back into these creeks a little bit more. And so they're sitting off of this hump because they don't want to be on that main channel. The water came up, so they want to be closer to these secondary points or like secondary underwater areas. And, you know, sometimes again, the water comes up and I might find these fish pushed further back in these creeks and these guts. But then when the water's falling or they're pulling a lot of current, a lot of times those fish will pull out of those guts because the water's dropping and they'll full pull back out to the outside of these points. So all things you have to take into account. I probably should slow down and discuss that all in a video sometime. There's so much that goes into offshore fishing and so much to think about. And so I'll kind of repeat that stuff throughout the stream. Uh, but I, it's already 15 minutes and I've just been talking about Washita in like one creek on Washita. So if you can't tell, I got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, I want to jump over to some questions really quick though. I got a bunch of questions coming in and I just want to see uh, what everyone's talking about over here. 241 people on. That is amazing, guys. That is so awesome. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's see. Uh, JT saying most la uh, lakes are graphed accurately. I don't see, uh, do you find Navionics to be fairly accurate? So Navionics here on this lake actually kind of sucks. Uh, it's okay in, in this creek, but like as we go further back up in like here, like these are some of the areas I like to fish. And if you look, the, there's, there's no contour lines. Like there's a nice hump out here that's really good. There's a bunch of humps in here. You can't see anything. That's, all these contour lines are just bad. That's because there's a bunch of standing timber back in here, and I'm sure they just didn't want to drive the boat back in and do that. And so I actually use the Lake Master chip for this, but my Lake Master chip doesn't work very well on my graph. I don't really know. I need to get that looked at. Maybe if you guys have had the same issue on my Onyx unit, the Lake Master chip won't find my GPS location, and then I can't actually see where I'm at on the lake. I can just look at the map. So that's a little bit annoying, but uh, normally the Lake Master uh, chips for your hummingbirds have a lot better contour lines on them, but they only come on a few lakes, like maybe 10 lakes per state. So they're a little bit more restrictive than the Navionics. Um, and then, let's see here. I had no idea bass would be in 60 to 70 feet of water. Uh, I have water that deep in my lake. Yeah, that's realistic fishing saying that. Yeah, they get super deep. I didn't, I never expected that either, but I know a bunch of guys in Table Rock catch them that deep. They're catching them right now that deep, which is crazy. Um, Josh Hood says, uh, you are the best. Uh, I came across uh, for explaining things. Even my old man can understand how you explain things with graphing units better than most pros do. That's awesome. Appreciate that, man. I'm glad you and your dad like the content. Um, then one rod, one reel says 39 degree water temp. What's up, man? Good to see you uh, on the stream. That's pretty awesome that uh, you're jumping in. Uh, one of the top guys on YouTube. Uh, so many people jumping in. I know I'm skipping a ton of comments. Um, Got skunk fishing uh, blizzard today, 24-acre reserve from the bank. Only at one spot where the main channel swung against the bank. I was fishing 20 to 40 uh, feet of water. Um, got a few perch. Yeah, that's, you know, fishing from the bank is really tough this time of year in the wintertime. Uh, a lot of times, though, you know, where you're talking about where those creek channels swing up against the bank, those are really good areas. Like right here, this is a really nice bluff wall that's in the, on Lake Washita. And what will happen is that, you know, these fish, if you look in this creek, there's not really that much for them to get on in the wintertime. There's these secondary points, like they'll stage on these points in the pre-spawn. They'll pull up in these pockets and they'll you know, want to spawn here. They'll stage on this. I've caught fish on jerk baits here. I've caught them off this point right here on a jerk bait. Uh, in the spring, there's a nice flat spot up on top and it's like 40 foot of water. And sometimes you might be able to find some fish out here, like off these points on Alabama rigs on a windy day or cloudy day. But a lot of times those fish just, you know, don't want to be sitting on these shallower points without a creek channel swinging right by. But what they will do is they'll sit on these bluff walls. And one thing people don't talk about a lot is that you can actually catch fish fishing vertically right next to a bluff wall. And for those of you who don't know what a bluff wall is, that's a 90 degree bank. And there's a lot of times shad that'll sit out there in 20, 30, 40 feet of water right off those bluff walls, and you can catch them fishing a jigging spoon or a hair jig or a float and fly, stuff like that, off of these bluff walls. And you, know, you don't actually have to fish on the bank, you can just drop straight down into that 30, 40 feet of water. So if you're fishing down the bank, that float and fly is a really good technique, just Google that. Um, I catch them out here in Washington that sometimes. Um, but other than that, uh, that's kind of like the 
that part of the Washita. I want to speed up because I need to jump to all the other lakes, but I do want to show you up here some of the offshore stuff I fish on Washita in the grass. And I have a video I want to make on this, but I've been so swamped with all the other videos I'm trying to make that I haven't been able to get to it. But I want to jump over to, to Google Earth really quick to show you guys some of this offshore grass because it's really cool what you can find with Google Earth for offshore fishing, and most people don't get that. So here's a spot that I love to fish offshore on Lake Washita. You may have seen this in some of my videos that I've talked about, but this is a little ditch spot that I've caught so many fish on, and it's just so good. And if we take this lake back by going up to the little arrow pointing to the left and then drag this lake back a few years, what you can see is you can actually see this ditch really clearly. Boom. Just like that. And you can see this nice ditch that winds in into this pocket. And what happens is these fish will sit off the point of this ditch. The point of this ditch is in maybe 9 to 12 feet of water right here. And then right here it's like 180 to 100 feet of water. So really deep back in this creek. And these fish will sit in 20 to 30 feet of water on the edge of this grass line. And all of this green area is all grass. So you have grass right here, grass right here, and grass all the way up in this ditch. And the grass goes out to 20 feet of water and then it stops. And there's standing timber in here as well. And normally first thing in the morning or on cloudy days, these fish will pull up on the points of this ditch or right on this inside turn right here where there's a little bit steeper edge. And I've caught so many four, five, six pound bass off this spot uh, on Washita. And basically it's really only good in the winter time from maybe December to January time frame because that's when those fish are actually uh, you know out there that deep. A lot of times on the grass lakes into February, those fish will start pulling up shallower in the grass. You can catch them on lipless crankbaits and wiggle warts, stuff like that, Carolina rigs, and they'll get shallower quicker even if the water temp's like 48, 49 degrees. But when it's in that 45 degree range, these fish will pull up on these points and they'll feed. But then after they start um, feeding on these points in the morning and the sun starts to come out, they'll actually pull off of these points and they'll get in this creek channel and suspend over 30, 40, 50, 60 feet of water. And it's really hard to catch them. And so on these grass lakes, normally what I found is that I like to fish the grass when I have cloudy conditions and when I have uh, overcat or when I have like uh, first thing in the morning conditions, so low light conditions. That's what I was looking for. So low light or overcast conditions. Basically, any time when the sun's not out, because that'll push those fish shallower. But then when you know, there's a bunch of other spots I can talk about that are good in through here. There's some really good, you know, little ditches and points and turns back up in here that are sometimes good. Um, there's a bunch of little humps out here that are sometimes good. All places. I don't want to get too caught up on that, you can go to Google Earth and check them out yourself. I know the guys on Washington are like, no, no, stay, show me all the spots, but uh, I need to keep something to myself. But anyways, uh, what I will do is I'll go back down to this part of the lake, because you can see there's really not that much grass off these points. You don't really see that hard grass line. And I'll get in these parts of the creeks on those sunnier days, because a lot of times it's easier to find those fish when there's no grass. They're used to not getting up in the grass, which will then keep those fish a little bit deeper. So on the grassy parts of your lakes, those fish are going to be stay shallow and feed when it's overcast and then again those fish on the lower end where there's not as much grass will sometimes pull up shallow with the overcast but most of the time they'll sit out deeper so that's what I like to do on Washita fishing out deep and so I'm gonna switch over answer a couple questions here then switch back over to uh, Table Rock Lake so I stay a little bit on schedule don't want to be too uh, too off there but anyways um Oh, Josh Hood, $10 super chat. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate all the vids. Even the stars would love Lake of the Ozarks. Um, uh, Lake of the Ozarks, but uh, the upgrade version. Okay, awesome. I can potentially check out Lake of the Ozarks on uh, one of my next streams because it's really good this time of year. Uh, there was someone who had, had asked that already on Patreon too, so I'll probably try to check that out next stream uh, most likely just because um, – it's really good time of year for Lake of the Ozarks. I think I've had like two or three other people talk about that too. Um, let's see here. Uh, I must say, after watching your videos, I'm constantly using Google Earth. That's Jordan Phillips. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. And uh, is Washita pronounced Washita or w w Wakita? It's Washita. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, if that's right, that's how I pronounce it and everyone I know pronounces it, but actually it might just be wrong. I have no idea. We are from Arkansas, so our pronunciations aren't always the best, to be honest. So I apologize for that up front. Um, <laughs> uh, anyways, there's a bunch of guys uh, in here talking, talking to one rod, which is awesome. Um, 
I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through all the comments after the stream, guys, and knock them out one by one. So if you have to drop off, this video does get uploaded back to YouTube right after the stream. And so you can go back and check out all the spots I'm looking at. Listen, because I know I talk fast all the time because I want to try to get everything out of my head as fast as possible. So if I do need to slow down, let me know. But I'm trying to just jam as much information in. Maybe watch it back on like half speed or three quarter speed that might actually work pretty well though my voice might get really deep <laughs> but uh, anyways so let me jump over to um some uh so next lake to table rock and then we will uh we'll answer all your questions near the end of the stream on um, the last little bit so moving just a little bit north of Lake Washita to the Arkansas border, we have Table Rock Lake. This is another awesome fishery. A lot of Bassmaster Elite Series events out here over the years. There's been some FLW tournaments out here as well. A really famous lake. And uh, it's a beautiful lake. It's really big and expansive. It's part of the um, uh, White River chain of lakes. And actually Beaver Lake is a lake that's really close to my apartment. I live uh, in Rogers, Arkansas. So this lake's really close to me. I'm doing a video series right now. Beaver Lake is kicking my butt. I'm catching keepers. I'm just catching like two pounders. And I know that's good on wash or on beaver for a lot of the times of the year, but twin tournaments need to be catching like 15 to 17 pounds. So I need to find out how to catch some bigger fish. I'm going to do some individual tournaments starting in March. And I'm going to be doing a video series on how to practice fish and how I practice for tournaments. Now I'm going to video all my tournaments, show you how I break down and prepare for tournaments, how I fish the tournaments, all that stuff. And I fished over 150 tournaments in my life. And so I'm going to really excited to uh, do all that. Um, so uh, one rod saying peace out, uh, keep up the vids. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Uh, anyways, we have um, this is the uh, Lake Washita. This is the lower end of the lake. So this is the deepest, clearest part of the lake. As you can see, it's really uh, clear water. You can see that because the water is kind of dark. Then you have the Kimberling City area, which is uh, right the mid part of the lake where you kind of have the um, break between the um, – this is the White River. I don't remember what this river is called. Uh, it's like a fox or the wolf or something like that. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know all this stuff, but uh, there's two rivers that run up here, and all these places are good to fish. The lower end is normally pretty good for those offshore fish. You can catch spotted bass and smallmouth down here. And same thing with this Kimberly City, Mid Lake area. And then the White River is better for largemouth, again, still offshore. And then this is the dirtiest part of the lake, this part of the the, uh, the lake up here. And so let's jump over to Navionics. I can show you guys kind of what is going on with Table Rock. So here's Table Rock Lake. Uh, first up, let's just move down to the uh, lower end of the lake, um, down by the dam, and we'll just kind of talk about, in general, what people are looking for on Table Rock Lake. So hopefully this loads. Let me refresh my page really quick. Sorry to blind you there. Okay, there we go. So anyways, uh, Table Rock Lake, basically in the wintertime, there's two predominant patterns out here. You can either go down the bank fishing a wiggle wart or a jerkbait, so a crankbait or a jerkbait, or you can fish offshore really deep and get into the middle of these creeks and fish a jigging spoon and a drop shot, stuff like that, for offshore bass. And really the predominant way to catch those fish is to look for balls of bait out here off of offshore structure and in the middle of these pockets. And if you look at this lake, I mean, it's 200 feet deep out here in the center, like 180 feet deep, super deep. There's flooded timber. There's all kinds of places where these fish can be. Uh, lots of little creeks and turns and so many contour lines. And so where do you even start? Well, normally what I would do if I was going out here on Table Rock and I wanted to find some offshore bass, I would run first to one of the major creeks and I would start here at the main part of the creek. And all I'm gonna do to find those offshore bass is just start graphing and looking for big balls of bait. And what happens out here is these fish might just start suspending over 100 feet of water. So the bottom is 100 feet deep. Those fish might suspend in 60, 50 to 60 feet of water, over 100 feet of water, chasing bait. Sometimes when you get warmer temperatures or you get some rising water, stuff like that, they might pull up and start suspending over 60 feet of water and maybe sit in 30 to 40. They might also sit over the tops of deep trees. If you have deep trees that come up to 50 or 60 feet, maybe even 40 feet, they'll sit in the tops of those standing trees that were cut down or that weren't cut down when the lake was flooded. Normally the, the trees were only cut down about 
30 feet into the lake and the, less, the rest were left out there. And so basically places you want to be looking for, same stuff we talked about in Washita, but it's the end of all of these main lake points, ends of these kind of points out here. You have all kinds of just little points and guts. And so I'm just going to be graphing over the tops of these points, looking for balls of shad on my graph. And if you don't know what shad looks like on your graph, check out my video, which is a complete guide to bass fishing electronics. It should have all that in there. I'm also going to try to make a video uh, on all of this pretty soon. I'm going to try to get over the table rock. It's been kind of bad lately, apparently. So I'm going to wait a little bit, but apparently the deep bite kind of went away. It was really good earlier this year. Um, but basically what these guys are doing is they're just graphing, and what will happen is that when the lake is pulling a lot of current, so there's a lot of current running through Table Rock, those fish will suck out of these creeks, and they'll get near the main lake. And that's because they're pulling water out, and those fish want to get uh, near the mouths of the creeks, and they also want to get near that current because it washes a lot more bait uh, through this system, and it's easier to ambush the bait. So these fish will want to get near the main part of these creeks and the mouths of these creeks when there's a lot of current running. You can check the current on the um, Corps of Engineers website, so check that out. And then when there's not as much current, uh, what happens is these fish will pull back into these creeks a little bit, and they'll start sitting out pretty much right in the center of these creeks, right on the break where it starts to break back up to 50, 60, 70 feet of water. So like right here, here's a perfect spot for some fish to sit up. And it's a really subtle spot, but if you look, you have contour lines that are really close together, and then they slightly start to spread out as you move right here, and they spread out just a tiny bit. And that's a little bit flatter spot in 70 feet of water. And if there's trees and stuff down there, that's gonna elevate those trees just a little bit. And that's something a little bit different for those fish to sit on, and they'll sit right on that spot right here. And basically, that is one of those spots that those fish will suspend. So what I would do is I would just start here in the mouth of the creek, and I would just idle my boat, and I would idle this is like a nice little bank. If you look, it's really steep, and then it starts to shallow out over here. Right here could be a good spot, so I'll just idle down that. And I'll kind of just make zigzags. I kind of zigzag back and forth, um, trying to get you know into that 100 feet of water. Then I'll zigzag back to the 60 feet of water, and I'll just kind of work my way through. And sometimes you might miss fish doing this, because you might be zigging through here to 60, and the fish are right here in 100. But normally, you can find multiple schools of fish out here this time of year. So I'll zigzag through this creek until I find a big school of bait. And normally this time of year when you find one big school of bait in like 50 feet of water, the rest of the bait in this part of the lake is gonna be in 50 feet of water. So if you find fish in the mouth of this creek in 50 foot, chances are you can go to the mouth of this creek and graph around in 50 foot and find another school of bait and run down here, find another school of bait in 50 feet of water. And normally you can run that for about maybe five mile sections of the lake. And then maybe as you move up here to the Kimberling City area, those shad might be pushed up a little bit further back in the creek, maybe suspended over 40 feet. Maybe they're even deeper, who knows, because the water's uh, colder. But either way, normally, you know, the fish will be doing slightly similar things in five mile stretches of these lakes or three to five mile stretches. Then you'll have to kind of relocate where the shad and the fish are. But anyways, you just graph through this creek, keep graphing, and you'll work your way all the way back in here. I'll work down both sides of the creek. And then we get to this little high spot and boom, I see a giant school of fish on my graph. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to pick up either a jigging spoon, so a one ounce lead spoon uh, that you can find like a cotton cordell spoon, three quarter ounce or one ounce, or I'll pick up a drop shot. And you can also fish a Demiki rig if you guys know what that is. Uh, and just drop that bait straight down using my electronics and then shake my rod and actually use my electronics to catch those fish. And if you guys want to know uh, what or how I find those fish offshore and then graph them and then do the video game fishing, just let me know. I live pretty close to Table Rock and I can go out there and make a video on that even this weekend if you want me to. So leave some comments here in the chat. Also leave comments on this video. And if I get enough comments to do a video game fishing video, uh, let's say I need to get I need to get 50 comments about doing a video game fishing video either in this stream or on the... Uh, on my YouTube video, and I also need to get, well, let's just do that, let's just do that for now, H 50 comments about doing a video game fishing video, and I will go out there this weekend, I'll cancel all my plans for all the other videos, and I'll just make that video, if that's what you guys want, so just make, uh, <laughs> just make some comments in there, and I'll count them all up, and then if it's good, you'll see it next week, so anyways, um, 
basically, again, just graphing through here. I might spend three or four or five hours edit or uh, not editing. I do spend that much time editing, but idling through these vid these. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm I'm idling through videos and I'm editing through my uh, my graphs. I don't know what I'm what I'm talking about, guys. I'm all messed up from making YouTube videos. But anyways, I'll idle through these creeks and I'll look for those fish on the graph. And once I find a little spot, like right here, another high spot right by a creek channel, 70 feet of water, and I find some fish suspended out there, again, pick up those jigging spoons and I'll drop my bait down to where the fish are and I'll work that bait. Or if I see a big ball of bait on my graph, I'll drop that jigging spoon down through the bait and work it down in those... Um, uh, those shad schools, and most of the time you can get some good spotted bass and largemouth to come up and grab your jigging spoon. You can catch some really good fish doing that. So uh, that's kind of what I do when I'm graphing through here. Again, you know, all these spots, there's another little like hump right here and, you know, 40 feet of water, 35, 40 feet of water. There might be some fish set off here. Um, you know, set off here, you can catch some good fish. Um, sometimes, too, these fish will actually get in just the center of these creeks. And so you might even find some fish out here further back from the creeks sitting out here in 70 feet of water just suspended. Here's a nice little drain or a little pocket that feeds here, and then the creek continues. These fish might just sit right out here in the middle of this pocket further back in here, especially first thing in the winter or as the winter progresses. And you can just find some fish just schooled up in the backs of these pockets. And so pretty easy way to actually put some keeper bass in the boat. This isn't always the best way to catch big fish, but I know earlier this year in December and early January, actually mainly December, a lot of tournaments were being won with 15 pounds, 16 pounds, just fishing out here in the middle of these creeks with that jigging spoon. Sometimes they fish a Rapala jigging wrap, which is a ice fishing jig, and they'll fish that down there as well. That's another good bait that people throw. And so, you know, that's kind of what you do on the lower end of the lake. It's the same thing like this creek here. It doesn't matter what creek you go to. There's fish, so many fish in Table Rock. But you just come through here, you know, graph down this point, graph around here, zip, make those zigzags, wait till you find some schools of bait or schools of fish, then you drop down on them and catch them. And normally what happens is when you have a ton of current blasting through the lake, a lot of times it'll spread out the schools and spread out the fish. So you might not see a thousand fish on your graph when there's a ton of current flowing. But then once that current starts to slow down, those fish will kind of group up a little bit more. Uh, that's just... Uh, I, that's just what I've heard. I haven't really experienced too many days. I haven't been out here too many days doing this, so I don't really know back and forth, like with the current, no current. This is just what I've heard from people and friends and watching videos, all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff on Table Rock out there. And then same thing kind of applies when you get to the Kimberling City area. Same deal, you know, graphing out here. Maybe those fish might even set up here out here on some of these main lake humps and ridges like this little spot right here, uh, out here off this point. Otherwise, they might pull up on these points, these little gravel, flat gravel points out here, suspend off of this, get up in these creeks, all kinds of places that these fish can get. So there's a ton of stuff that, uh, you know, these fish can get on this lake. It's mainly about just graphing as much as you can. And that's the challenge of fishing offshore in the wintertime. A lot of times you have to see those fish on your graph before you fish them. That's normally how it is all the time when you're fishing, but it's especially, or when you're fishing offshore, I mean, but it's especially important in the wintertime to make sure you see a bunch of fish on your graph before you actually step up and fish. And a lot of times I struggle with that because I'll graph over a spot and I'll be like, oh, there's two or three fish down there. And I've known from experience that sometimes you can find, like, let's say you graph down this little point and there's some flooded timber out here and there's, you know, five or six little dots over the top of that timber. Sometimes I have the urge to just stop, pick up a spoon, drop that jig down there and try to catch those three or four or five fish because a lot of times those are your bigger fish and I, I don't know, it, it works like one out of ten times and it's just not worth it. It's just not efficient enough. It takes me a lot of time to get up on the trolling motor, to drop that bait down there, to fish it for 10, 15 minutes, try to get those fish to bite. Because a lot of times on these big offshore schools, what will happen is that you have to get one of those bass to trigger, especially when you put the boat right on top of them. You have to sit there and work that jig down there for four, five, six minutes at a time, working that thing up and down, moving the boat around, trying to make five or six drops there a minute a piece and jig that bait in different water depths, all kinds of stuff to get those fish to fire. But then once one of those fish fires, it's game on. You can just catch fish like crazy every cast. And Jacob Wheeler has a really good video. He has like a major league fishing style format on Lake Martin with uh, Mark Daniels Jr. video game fishing. They didn't really talk about 
how they were doing it really in that video, but it just kind of shows, you know, they didn't get many bites, didn't get many bites. Then once they got those schools fired up, they're catching them every cast. And a lot of them were, you know, small little spots, but still fun to go out and catch them. So that's kind of this area. And then as you move up the lake, you get same kind of deal, you know, just little points. And basically once you get up this, uh, the James River, or the White River, this is the James. Is that what this is? I think this is the James River now that I'm thinking about it. I feel like this is the James River. I probably could read the map here. Um, but yeah, it's the James River. This is the James. This is the White. I knew I knew it in the back of my head. But anyways, these fish will get up in here and they'll get on these same type of places. These little points, they're kind of between two creek channels. They'll get on the, t the tips of these points. These fish are a little bit easier to find actually almost up in here because there's not as much for them to get on. But as you move back in these creeks, you just idle for hours until you see some fish on your graph right in through here. Boom, catch them. So that's pretty much what I'm looking for, guys. Nothing crazy, nothing super um, fancy about it. It's just getting out there and just trying it. So I'm um, trying to get over some comments. There's a ton of people commenting today, 249 people. And that's my most ever by far. So that is amazing. Um, I'm getting so many comments on this, uh, this deal right here. Uh, can't wait for tournament vids. My first year starting fishing competitively. I'm um, really excited to do those two, man. Uh, that was, uh, Vaden Ellis, Josh Hood. Glad, uh, about your info. Not about the amount of viewers they will come. Uh, thanks, man. Appreciate that. And then, um, let's see here. Love to see a vehicle fishing video, video fishing video. Um, let's see here. There's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh my gosh. Okay. Looks like I'm doing a video game fishing video already. Uh, <laughs> that is awesome. That is so cool. Uh, so many people are doing that. Uh, I can definitely make that video then. That is uh that that's no problem for you guys. I'll just go graph and I'll find some fish. I need to find some fish now. That's that's my biggest challenge, I guess. Now I have my money where my mouth is and actually go find some. Um I don't know if I'm going to fish down here in this part. I know the White River is pretty well, and it's closer to my house. And But then I know uh, I'll, I'll figure it out. I need to figure this out. There's a local fishing report. There's a couple guys who make local fishing reports out here that I always follow them. They're local guides, and they normally set you pretty straight. So I'll just watch some of their videos and see what they're doing. Then use my instincts as well. Hopefully between the two of that, I'll be able to catch some fish. So anyways. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to jump over to our last lake, which is Lake Hartwell. And I'm really excited for this one because this is one I know quite a bit about based on uh, doing some tournament breakdowns for the Bassmaster Classic. So I know all kinds of places on this lake. So let's jump over there. So let me transition over to Google Earth real quick. Boom. So here's Lake Hartwell. So Lake Hartwell is... Uh, a lake in or a reservoir in Georgia, and there's been two Bassmaster Classics fish out there recently. One one by Casey, or there's been three or four. I don't know. Alton Jones won one, um, 2010 maybe, and then no, maybe that was Skeet Reese. No, maybe that was Alton Jones, 2012. I don't know. I no, that was Chris Lane. Anyways, I don't know my classic history as well as I should. Anyways, Alton Jones won a classic out here. Casey Ashley won a classic out here in 2015. And then 2017, uh, Jordan Lee won back-to-back -back classics, uh, which is awesome. And so that's the uh, venue that these guys had fished. And this lake is really cool. It's a huge fishery. There's so many places for these fish to hide. Uh, a lot of offshore places. There's also some shallow water areas up the river. This is the river. It's really hard to see, actually, this on Google Earth. Let me see if I can find a better image. It's actually, I remember when I made my tournament breakdown of this, it was really hard to see this lake. Here we go. So here we go. You can see down here, this is the deep clear part. You can see because that water is dark blue. Oh, that may disappear. Dark blue. And then it gets a little bit more stained as you move up the lake, but not super dirty. And then as you get up these rivers, it's really dirty. And, you know, some muddy water up here that those fish like to get in. So let's jump over to Google Earth or to Navionics. Apologize for that. Navionics. So Lake Hartwell. So basically what happens in the wintertime on Lake Hartwell is that you have blueback herring in this lake. And blueback herring are things you have over in those uh, East Coast, like South Carolina, Georgia lakes. And they're basically like a filet mignon for these bass. They're uh, basically the best thing that a bass can eat. And 
those big large mouth and big spotted bass on Lake Hartwell will chase those blueback herring over any single bait out there. If there's a crawfish down there or if there's a shad down there, they'll pass it up. They'll pass up a giant group of shad just to eat one blueback herring. And so these fish are really dependent on where the blueback herring are moving. And so what a lot of these guys do on Lake Hartwell is they look for places where those blueback herring are going to move up on to feed on plankton or just kind of, you know, where they get up shallower, which are good ambush spots for these largemouth and spotted bass. And what will happen is these blueback herring will just sit out here. As you can see, there's a nice creek channel that winds through Hartwell through here. And they'll just sit out here in super deep water in 100 feet of water, and they'll just sit out here and just chill. And then when you get some cloudy conditions, maybe you get um, some wind blowing, these fish will pull up onto these little points and onto these little drops. And as you can see, like right here, you have a nice creek that winds through here, creek channel, and then there's a nice point, and there's another creek that winds in. These Blueback herring sometimes might feed up on top of this point. Maybe there's some brush piles down there, or some standing timber, stuff like that. And those fish can pull up onto that standing timber or onto those brush piles and start feeding on the plankton and stuff. And those largemouth and those spotted bass will pull right up on top and feed on them. And a lot of times those largemouth will just kind of chase those blueback herring out here in the middle, but they move around so much and migrate so much, it's really hard to stay on top of them unless you have one spot that you can just sit all day and wait for those blueback herrings to move up on top of a spot. And I'll show you a spot that Takahiro Amori did that on in a little bit. But just a couple spots I want to show you that I know guys have caught him on in the Classic. Right here, Brent Ayler almost made a comeback at the Bassmaster Classic fishing this little point right here. Um, he caught three really big spot bass, three plus pounders on the last day of the Classic to almost take the championship away from Jordan Lee, but he didn't quite get it done. And he was really one of the only guys fishing offshore that whole tournament other than Takahiro. Uh, wait, was Takahiro? Takahiro was fishing offshore that tournament, yeah. Takahiro was also fishing offshore, so he was doing really well. So Takahiro and Brett were doing really well in this tournament. But anyways, if you look at the spot, it's pretty much perfect for winter fishing. Uh, these guys were a little bit past winter. They were moving into the pre-spawn, but it's this is more of a winter spot than a pre-spawn spot, I would say. So what was happening is that there's this creek channel that winds in through this creek, and it runs up right against this little point here. And it's in the mouth of a spawning pocket, so it's a great place for these fish to pull up when they want to stage to spawn. And what happens most of the day is those blueback herring will be just chilling out here in the middle of this pocket, or in the middle of this creek channel. And then every once in a while, let's say in the middle of the afternoon when the wind starts to blow, or maybe they'll pull up there when it gets really sunny. Uh, sometimes it's hard to predict what the shad will do, but sometimes they'll pull up here when it gets really sunny to kind of sun, whatever it is. They'll pull up on top of this spot up here, and there were some brush piles out here that Brett was fishing, and these shad were pulled up on the spot, and there were some spotted bass pulled up there, and he was fishing a drop shot and some brush piles off this point in 20 to 35 feet of water. And this spot wasn't good all day. There were certain points when those fish would move up to feed. So what Brett would do is he would just run a bunch of these points throughout the day, and he would just find the areas where there was some uh, blueback herring kind of moving around off the points. He would just graph around and find areas where he saw some blueback herring off these points, and he knew, okay, at some point they probably are going to move up to feed, and they're either going to move up to feed on like maybe this point or this point so you would probably just test them out in practice i can't say this for sure but that's how i would do it um and you know there's so many places he can try to find some fish again you know here's a nice little point up here 30 feet of water creek channel runs right by it that could be a dynamite spot you know if we move back over here here's another nice little point that runs off the island creek channel swings in that could be a great little area um you could get even tighter to some of these banks and maybe fish off some of these points right out here where that creek channel swings in and catch them off this stuff right here so there's a ton of different areas you can fish kind of use the same uh thought process i showed before which is basically um you know look for places where that creek channel swings up against some of the shallower water and where the contour lines get really tight together. So like this spot right here could be really good for some of these deep fish, even right over here. And basically it's just that creek channel swings in next to some flatter water and there's a steep drop there. That's what you're looking for in the winter time. And basically he was fit, just running around fishing all that and he was catching some really good fish doing that. Another thing that the pros would do is they sometimes would actually run to, let's say this creek right here. I know Casey Ashley was catching some fish in this creek uh, during the classic. 
uh, when you won in 2017, 2015. Maybe Takahiro was fishing offshore in 2015. Maybe I'm getting that backwards. I'm not 100% on that. Um, I think I might be getting that backwards. I think Tak was doing was leading in 2015, not the year that uh, Brett Ayler was fishing. But either way, what happens is a lot of times on these herring lakes, just like I was talking about on Lake Washita, those fish a lot of times will pull up shallow first thing in the morning or on overcast days. And what they'll do is they'll pull up into the backs of these pockets and they'll get all the way back in the center of these creeks and they'll just feed up and gorge on shad because those shad will be up here all night and they'll just be feeding on the shad that pull up here shallow overnight first thing in the morning and you can find you can sometimes catch the tail end of that night bite back in these pockets and a lot of guys i know jacob peroznik did really well like 17 pounds one morning fishing a pocket just like this and it's way back in one of these creeks it's like way in the back back here it's like 20 30 feet of water and they just fish in the center of these cuts and the shad would get bunched up down in the middle of these cuts and you catch them on an underspin which is just a uh, swim bait head with a little spinnerbait blade on it with a swim bait on the as a trailer and sometimes catch them on a jerk bait too. And Casey Ashby was fishing in here. And basically you just work your way back in these cuts and look for those shad. And then once you find the shad, just start fan casting down the center of these cuts and you can catch some fish. And that's a really good pattern on these blueback herring lakes all around Georgia and North Carolina, South Carolina, places like that. And it's really only good for the first hour of the morning. It's not an all-day bite, but it can be prolonged by cloud cover. So if you have some cloud cover, these fish might stay up here shallow for an extra 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And another place like this that Casey Ashley was actually using when he helped win the tournament was way up here on this part of the lake. And you can see there's a bunch of waypoint or a bunch of dots here because this is where Casey actually won so there's a bunch of people who know about the spot but he was fishing this little cut right here it's actually a little like just creek that winds in there's a big shoal or a ridge that runs out here and then there's some islands and there's a really deep drop out in front of this island and Casey was fishing you can actually see in the videos he was sitting his boat right out in here and he was casting over the tip of this point the tip of this point and right out in here off kind of this area where this steep drop is and what would happen is that in the mornings, these fish would pull up out of this creek channel and they would get up on top of these little, these little points. You can see that shoal sticks out and there's a little point that sticks in that, that bumps out and then there's that deep water. And these fish were sitting right here where that 40 foot of water hit that 70 feet of water. And they would sit out there in 30 to 40 feet of water right on the bottom first thing in the morning. And he could catch some really good fish doing that, catch a limit pretty quick of good ones. But then the last couple days of the tournament, you had overcast conditions almost all day. And those overcast conditions kept those fish up shallow on these ridges. And as you move through these creeks back in here, these fish would pull up out of that creek channel and set up on like this point right here. And they would chase those blueback herring because the blueback herring would move up shallower with the cloud cover and they would just sit up there all day. And because there was cloud cover all day the last day of that tournament, he was able to capitalize by catching some really, really good fish on this spot. And he kind of worked his way all the way back in this creek, just fishing down the center of this ditch and was catching some fish back up in here as well, just casting in the center, letting that bait sink down to 15, 20, 30 feet of water and reeling it in. And then sometimes he would let that bait go all the way down to the bottom. And a lot of the fish over here were sitting right on the bottom in 30 to 40 feet of water, again, catching them on that underspin. And then the last place I got for you um, that I know about is actually, I don't remember where it is now off the top of my head. Uh, it's been a couple nights since I've slept, or I've slept a couple nights since this breaking down this lake. But basically, Takahiro, he was fishing off one of these islands. I don't remember where he was. He was. I'll try to find this. He was fishing off one of these islands. I'll have to find it at some point, and I can maybe pull that back up. If you actually want to know, um, I made a video breaking down the Bassmaster Classic in 2015 as a precursor to the Bassmaster Classic last year on Hartwell. So you can check out that video on my channel. It's a complete breakdown of the all the best areas and spots those guys were fishing. And so check out that. You can actually look at both the Bassmaster Classic breakdown and uh, from 2015 and from 27 or 2018 when Jordan repeated and won that classic. So that's pretty cool. And so uh, those are just a couple areas these guys fish out here on Hartwell. Um, just to give you an idea of kind of what Takahiro was fishing. He was fishing an island. I think it may have been like one of these islands. I don't actually know it's not that one. It's I'm really bad for not knowing this. Um, I apologize, guys. Should have had this prepped. Ahead of time, I thought I could just 
remember it off the top of my head, but apparently my memory is not as good as I thought it was. But basically, there was an island. Let's just say it was over here, and there was a really sharp drop off this island. Uh, I think it was maybe like this island or something like that. And you can see there's a really sharp drop off this island, and there's some flooded timber out here. And I don't know if this is the exact spot, so bear with me for a little bit. But apparently there's some there was some timber that was sticking up off the bottom, and then it ended right as you pulled up on this point. And those fish would sit on that timber line where the timber was in like 40 to 50 feet of water. Then it would make a hard stop, and it would stop like right here, and then there'd be no timber. It would be a blank area. And what would happen is Takahiro was literally sitting on this point, uh, off one of these islands all day long. He would literally sit there the entire day and he would um, just wait for those blueback herring to move up on top of the point and then he would drop a drop shot down there and catch those fish. And he would wait for those fish to kind of move off that timber line into that open space where there was no timber to chase those blueback herring and he would just see individual fish on his graph he dropped down to him. He catch him on that drop shot, and that's a very tedious way to fish. I could, I don't think I could ever do that. Sit on a spot all day for four days straight, just basically waiting to see something on your graph and dropping down there. But he led three days of the Bassmaster Classic doing that, and he almost took it home the last day. He just didn't get all the bites he needed on the last day. But that was pretty, pretty cool that he did that. So. That's Lake Hartwell for you. Um, that's offshore bass fishing in the wintertime. So hopefully you learned a bunch from this video and from this stream. There's 228 of you guys still on, which is amazing. Uh, I do want to go back through all the comments uh, and want to see what you guys are commenting on other than me doing the... Uh video game fishing video, but I'm going to go back through all your comments. If you guys have additional stuff, I'll stay on for the next like 20, 30 minutes just answering questions. So just start firing your questions away. I'm just going to scroll back up to the top, just answer questions. If you guys don't want to listen to Q&A, then I uh, hope you enjoyed the video and check out some of my other videos on my channel and look out for that video game fishing video. Apparently it, it's happening already from what I'm seeing in the comments. So uh, if you guys want to tune out, uh, again, this stream is going to be posted live or going to be posted to YouTube afterwards. So you can check it all out and go through it again on three quarters speed but uh, anyways gonna take uh, a second now to just go through all these comments seems like a lot of people are freaking out that one rod was in here that is pretty awesome I must say um, let's see here are you fishing jigs along that grass line in the winter Dan going back to Lake Washita um, so let me switch back over there to Washita whoops just to show you guys what he is talking about Actually, crap, I'm a Washita marked. The thing that's scary, guys, is I can tell exactly which state and which lake is where basically by looking at the uh, mountain ranges and the shapes on the map on Google Earth because I look at so many maps all the time. So I can literally, like, you could take me out to here to the United States and be like, oh, where's Arkansas? Where's Lake Washita? Oh, it's right here. Oh, where's Lake Hartwell? Oh, it's right there. Oh, where's, you know, Toledo Bend or Sam Rayburn? Like, I can literally just, like, point those out from the sky, which... I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know what that really says about me as a person, but uh, that is one skill I do have, which is probably pretty pointless to, if we're being honest. So um, let me know what you think about that in the comments. Don't be too harsh, but uh, <laughs> anyways. Um, so yeah, what I'm doing with that jig, I've talked about it a couple times in some of my videos, but what I'm doing is sitting the boat out here in maybe 50 feet of water, casting up to the edge of that grass. I try to put my jig so it lands maybe within, you know, five to 15 feet of that grass edge and maybe 15 don't you don't want to cut it too close but 15 feet of that grass edge and kind of what I want to do is let that bait land in maybe 10 feet of water and then work it back all the way to 20 to 25 feet of water and again that grass ends in 20 feet so a lot of times those fish will sit around the edge of that grass right out in here in that 20 to 22 where the grass ends then sometimes fish will sit up in the grass a little bit but most of my bites come as I'm pulling it off that grass edge and it gets out there in the 20 25 feet of water that's why I keep the boat out here in 50 and make a long cast just to the very edge and then work that bait out I don't want to sit too close because otherwise I'm going to be fishing it too shallow and I'm not going to get that jig down in the strike zone. And another thing that helps fishing in the grass out deep like that is to throw a heavy jig. I throw a three-quarter ounce football jig in that grass, which helps a ton. Um, will you do a river system breakdown? Caleb Morgan's asking. Yes, I can definitely do that. Um, St. Lawrence River. I think I've broken down the Potomac a couple, maybe once or twice, maybe. Um, for on one of my very first streams. Uh, and then I think I've, I, don't, I haven't broken on the St. Lawrence. I'm not very good at smallmouth stuff, guys, because I don't fish smallmouth hardly at all. So I don't like to do breakdowns on like Lake Erie or a lot of the smallmouth lakes just because I don't 
have the expertise there. I can make a bunch of stuff up, but that's not really what I like to do on my channel. I like to just tell you what I know and from my experience, and I don't want to lie to you guys because that's not going to help anybody. I'm trying to keep it 100% transparent and just let you know exactly what I think would work and what I know works rather than trying to fabricate a bunch of stuff that uh, who knows if it, if it works or not. But anyways, see here. Keep in um, vertical jigging, vertical jigging, vertical jigging, vertical jigging, vertical jigging, video game fishing, do the video. <laughs> That's awesome. Anyways, uh, Zach fishes says, looks like you're doing the video. And then Caleb's think, think you got your 50 lol. That's pretty funny. Um, and then fish the moment nation. That is awesome. Uh, video game fishing. So many, so many. That is awesome. Um, and Samuel Wilson says there's hardly any video game fishing videos on YouTube. That's very true. And people don't do a very good job of explaining how to actually do it. There's guys who are like, oh, watch your bait go down and here's the sinker and the weight. But like, there's so much more to it than that. It's like, how do you find the fish? How do you get them to bite? How long do you stay on the spot? There's so much more that goes into that. That's where I always get like super into the weeds there. Oh, Jason, uh, Jason Walls. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, $50 uh, super chat. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, John, you continue to rock it. Another great session. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate the super chat. Uh, I was scrolled down on the stream. I hadn't got that far yet, but thank you so much. Really appreciate that, man. And then uh, where do you buy paper maps with contour lines? Most maps don't have details uh, like Navionics. Um, you can buy the paper maps. There's the hotspots map, which I use actually on Lake Washita. Do I have... I have some maps over here on Beaver Lake. Hotspot maps are really good, actually, if you have a lake that you fish a lot because they'll give extra detail, and sometimes they'll be a little bit different from what the Navionics maps show, and so they're really good. Actually, let me grab this really quick. I'll be back in a second. I promise I'm not leaving. I'm back. Anyways, here's my Beaver Lake Hotspots map, which I have been studying constantly. Um, basically, it's the exact same as an avionics map. I don't know why I'm opening up a paper map on the live stream, but why not? Um, here's what they look like. You can see there, there's all kinds of, that, that's not helping anybody. I don't know what I'm doing. This is great YouTube content right here. 10 out of 10. Please subscribe. Um, Anyways, uh, those are my paper maps. I love paper maps because they do give you extra detail, especially if you can find an old paper map that's not in color. If you can find a black and white paper map, those are gold. They have everything on them. I, I love finding black and white paper maps. Like That's like a gold mine, like a dream come true because they always have like all the good road beds. Someone actually like who is alive before the lake was flooded was like, oh, there's a cemetery here or there's you know an intersection here, all kinds of crazy stuff. So those are the maps to find are the black and white paper maps. You heard it here first. Um, their paper maps are coming back in a big way. Fish the moment 2019. Um, let's see here. Video, wow, so many video game fishing. Um, See here, excited to see your breakdown of Hartwell. I'll live seven, eight minutes from ramp. Hopefully that was good then for you. Uh, who said that? Sorry. Oh, I skipped. Oh, no, I skipped so far down. Um, one second here. That was Rick. Uh, yeah, I hope that worked out for you. I hope that was good, Rick. I hope that helped out um, and help you watch that. Watch those other videos I have on my channel from the Bassmaster Classic. Uh, I said we're saying, would you sit on a fish in a tournament and wait for them to feed or just bounce around and double back? That's in reference to talking about the um, fishing on Hartwell. Let me go back over here and talk about that for a second. So what I do personally, I cannot stand sitting on the spot for more than like 10, 15 minutes and just sitting there and fishing and fishing and fishing unless I'm catching fish. If I catch a fish, I'll sit there for 30 minutes. But even after that, if I start seeing them slow down and I've thrown like five or six different baits in there and not getting to bite, I leave unless there's like 30 boats in the area and they've seen me catch them all just because I'm impatient that way. And I like to fish fresh schools of fish. But basically what I would do is I would have a milk run. I would say, okay, this point looks really solid right here. This point looks really good right here. Um, this little... Uh, let me find something else. Right here, this point looks money right there. Um, using the word money, that's coming back in big in 2019 also. This little point right here. Um, 
There's all kinds of stuff I would just check out. I would just graph all this. Let's say I found a bunch of stuff. I would try to find like 30 spots out here on this lower end of the lake that I think potentially would have fish pull up, and I would look for brush up on top of a point. I would like pull up on this point, and I would say, okay, is there brush up here or something that would hold the fish? And then is there bait out here out in front? And I would say, okay, even if I don't catch anything there in practice, I would just start fishing them, and I would just rotate 20 or 30 spots waiting to see if I can run in and collide with a group of fish that's pulled up on the spot. And so I don't like to wait and sit around for them. I like to just play the numbers and fish as many spots as I can and then hopefully pull up on a couple that have some fish. And that's kind of my normal game plan there. Um, let's see here. Josh saying, if you do this weekend, I'd uh, love to meet up at Table Rock. Josh, I will uh, put that out on uh, uh, I'll comment on this video. If you leave a comment down below on the video after the live stream, I'll just comment down there afterwards, letting you know if I'm, where I'm going, what I'm doing. I think I'm going to launch near the White River, uh, but I'm not sure yet. Maybe Kimberling City. If anyone fishes Tabor Rock, leave a leave a um, something in the comments or in the in the chat, letting me know if I should fish the Kimberling City area or the White River area. Tell me which one is better, because I don't have a preference either way. I just know the White River is closer to my apartment. <laughs> Um, don't forget white grub on a jcat for suspended bass video game fishing. Yes, white grub on a jcat is also very good. Kind of similar. I like to fish the Damiki rig, but that's the same, pretty much the same thing. Damiki rig, drop shot, spoon. Um, Hartwell, where are you most likely to uh, places to look for cane piles? All the same places I was talking about. So cane piles are places are basically man-made brush piles, and people love to put the man-made brush piles on the most obvious-looking structures. So like this point right here. There's a creek channel that winds in. There's a point right here. There's a point right here. Wherever there's a really sharp break, the flat spot up on top near a creek channel, those are just money spots, and most of the best fishermen on these lakes know that, and they understand how to read these contour line maps. And so then they know, okay, the fish like to be around these areas. Let's go drop a bunch of cane piles, which is just basically um, brush that people get off the, the bank or like actual like canes that they get, and they'll – Tie them together, drop a center block on them, and drop them out here out deep for uh, man-made structures. So, you know, you just have to graph around and look for them, but they're everywhere. I mean, people put so many brush piles out, certain lakes for sure. Um, and Rick says he wish I had time to put out cane piles. Normally, I just look for other people's just because I don't want to bother trying to put them out myself. Um, and then uh, Ren says they'll pass up a blueback herring for an underspin. That's very true. Um, let's see here. How about fishing rivers? Um, they just find deep pockets. So for rivers, I can, um, I can show you real quick kind of what I do on, on river system. River systems are tough in the wintertime. I don't like fishing rivers in the wintertime. Let me actually go, I'll leave this here. Let me go over to, um, the Arkansas river, which is by my house in Little Rock. Let's see here. Rivers are really tough in the wintertime. Uh, I stay off of them if I can. The two things you want to look for in the wintertime on rivers is... Uh, where am I going? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, guys. Here we go. This is Little Rock. I don't know why I was in Hot Springs and the Hot Springs Little Rock. But anyways, um, this is a really good area on... Uh, the Arkansas River, this is Little Rock Pool, Pool 7, and one place they really like to get in the winter is Foosh Creek. And basically in the river, uh, in the, the wintertime in the river systems, the two things you want to look for are backwaters, which is pla and places they can get away from the current. So that's number one. So you want to find you know places where they can get out of the strong current, especially if you're getting a lot of rain and cold water. So instead of trying to fish out here on the main river, you can catch fish on the main river in the wintertime, don't get me wrong. They, they do get in the uh, main river and you can catch them there, but I normally have better success a little bit further back in these backwaters because this is where the fish want to spawn and there's also normally clear water back in there which will stay warmer and more stable and those fish just kind of like it in the winter a little bit better so one thing about this area this is Foosh Creek in on Little Rock Pool you can see there's two things in here that are really good first there's grass and second there's rock and it's hard to see the rock you can see it a little bit better right here I'm not showing you Google Earth I apologize there uh, let me put this back up rookie mistake Little Rock Pool. Here's Little Rock Pool. Arkansas River. Right here. This is Little Rock. Best city in America. Just kidding. Um, 
We have the uh, the arc server. They don't want to be on the main river because that's where all the current is, and it's pushing the current and making it really uh, muddy and cold and cooling muddy water is terrible and so whenever you can get a lot of runoff into these rivers it'll just cool down these uh the main river really fast to make it muddy and just bad so you want to stay out of those areas move into the creeks and the backwaters these creeks actually aren't always the best especially if you get heavy rains because they'll get washed out too and there's a lot of current through them but sometimes they're not that bad and this creek's really good because it has nice rock so second thing you want or the third thing you want to look for is rock because it holds heat and normally there's good rock on every river system and so the three places three things to look for are backwaters that have clear water they're out of the current so backwater clear water that's out of the current and rock and the rock is kind of secondary another thing you can look for is grass and if you have some deeper water back in some of these uh areas like this area here has some cleaner water and it's a little bit deeper these fish can get back up in here if the water's high enough and they'll get up in this grass because the grass will hold heat and it'll hold those fish shallow all uh, winter long as well so if you have grass in your river system just go there first that's the number one thing go to a backwater and look for grass you're going to find fish almost guaranteed on any river system and then after that again just get in these backwaters look for any place where you get some harder cover harder bottom and just you know fish a flat side crank bait fish a jerk bait if there's deeper water back in there stuff like that and you'll be good to go so that's what i'm looking for there um gonna keep going here do deep diving or medium diving crank baits need to bump off cover to be effective that's uh malice 23 uh, not always. Sometimes I can catch fish on the sus uh, suspended on like a striking 6XD or a 5XD, reeling it over the top of trees or over the top of brush piles. And sometimes those fish will just grab the bait even if it never hits the cover. Uh, that's just kind of... You kind of play that one by ear. A lot of times I like to fish swim baits rather than fishing a crankbait. If I'm fishing suspended bass, I seem to get more or catch more fish that way so you don't have to have them bounce off cover but that's what they're designed for it's you know that getting that deflection and that uh knock off the cover is what really triggers those bass so they're the most effective when you are bouncing them off cover that mean doesn't mean they won't work though if you're not and then let's see here Uh, Ricky saying, you, Johnny, you're one creek too far. He was casting toward Apple Island boat ramp. Oh, apologize, um, that Ricky. I don't know. Uh, I, I made that video a long time ago, so I may have been in the wrong creek. Apologize for doing that. I was at least in the right area, I think, right? Um, Johnny, continue to rock. It's Jason with the super chat. Appreciate that, man. Again, great content. Learn so much. Keep it up. That's William Witt. Um, love the info. Just fishing, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Any chance you're going to do the FLW Grand Lake Tournament in March? Uh, I will be there. I'll be there, Steve, uh, at the Grand Lake Tournament. That's really close to my house. So if you guys want to do a meetup there, let me know in the stream right now or in the comments afterwards. If you want to do a meetup in Oklahoma at Grand Lake for that event, uh, I can you know, set up time to you know talk about fishing. Um, if you guys are in town for the for the event or whatever like that too, while the pros are fishing, if you guys wanted to try to schedule a uh, a fishing guided fishing trip on one of the lakes in the areas. I don't want to go out to Grand because of the, you know, the tournament guys are out there, but we could go to some of the lakes in the area if you wanted to go do a guided fishing trip. Uh, I have some of those up on my Patreon page, so go join my Patreon page to see my posts on uh, the guided fishing trips. I'm only offering those to Patreon subscribers at the moment just to temper demand and I'm working on a website right now that'll launch that out so we can, I'll do guided fishing trips, personal lake breakdowns, fishing lessons, all that stuff and I'll have a calendar where you can book going forward in the future uh, and you can get on my calendar for that so I'm still working out how to design the website, all that while trying to make YouTube videos and do Patreon and work. It's really fun um, <laughs> but we'll figure that out and then Let's see here. Do the upper, mid, or lower lake fish better during the colder months or vice versa? So that's a great question. So uh, in general, I found, let me find a lake that has a good distinction between those three. Where are we going to go? So trying to think. Okay, let's just go to Grand. Why not? Here's Grand. So here's how Grand, um, oh, Hans, um, 
Gruner, thank you so much for the five dollar super chat. Sorry if I butchered your name there. Uh, I think that's ger that's pretty that's very German name, right? That has to be a German name. Uh, so I apologize for butchering that, but thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate that. So here's Grand Lake. So in general. Do the dirtier part of the lakes, are they better in the winter or the or the top end of the lake, the lower end of the midsection of the lake? And normally what I say when I'm fishing in the wintertime is that I like to fish the midsection to the lower section of any lake. The reason for that is because the water on the upper ends of most lakes is going to be muddier because that's where the rivers form. And so when you have a, um, a river system that flows, or when you have a river that flows into the upper end of this lake, that's going to push a lot of... Uh, new water into the lake from any rainfalls in the winter, which is going to muddy up the water and it's going to make the water colder faster. And basically what, you have to, what you'll know about, or what I can tell you about cold water, well, I've been talking for an hour and 14 minutes, guys. Apologize for the slip up there. But um, what I can tell you about muddy water is that it cools down faster than clear water. It also warms up quicker than the clear water. And so when you get a cold rain or you get some cold nights, that dirty water will cool down really quick. And the worst thing to fish is cooling muddy water. And you can tell if the water is muddy because you can see it's dirty brown right in here. You can see it's a brown color. And as you move down the lake, you can see the lake is like really dark and blue. And you can see that that is some clear water on Grand. And in general, because that water can cool down quicker because it's dirty, it'll sometimes cause those fish to get shocked. And there's just as many fish living up here on the uh, top end of this lake of Grand as there are down on the bottom end of the lake. But the thing about fishing this top end of the lake is because that water cools down faster, it'll put those fish in lockjaw a lot easier. So if there's a cold front coming or if there's a couple cold days or a couple war or cold rains, it'll shut the fishing down that area. And so instead, what I like to do is run down to the midsection of the lake. And you can also fish the deep clear part of the lake where it's really clear. The thing with that though is it's a lot harder to get those fish to bite if you are visibility is five to six, seven feet of visibility. And the reason for that is because they can see the bait really well. And so on the lower end of these lakes, normally you need to have good wind to get those fish to bite. And I'm making a video on that right now about one of my days on beaver. I actually went out on beaver yesterday not yesterday, this last weekend on Sunday, uh, today is Tuesday, but Sunday, and I was fishing on the clear end of beaver, so I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about on beaver, so here's beaver, I was fishing on the clear end of beaver, let me change this so it looks more like what beaver actually looks like, Let's see here, I know there's a good image here in a second, just bear with me for one second, here we go. So here's Beaver Lake, and what I did is I was like, okay, the forecast called for really windy conditions, and so I knew that it was going to be really windy, and I ran all the way up here to the clear end of the lake. Um, actually, this is the very clear end, but here at like five, six feet of visibility, and I was running over here trying to find some fish in this creek, and there was no wind on that day, and it was dead calm, and it's six feet of visibility. Those fish can see my bait from a mile away, and there's no disturbance in the water to break up the image of that lure, which makes it really easy for those fish to see the bait. And so what was happening is that these fish were just coming up and uh, you know, probably just looking at it, not biting it. I didn't catch any fish, and I fished out here for two, three, four hours with no wind. It was bright bluebird skies, like not good conditions. But it was actually pretty warm that day, so I'm like, well, these fish are probably going to want to pull up shallow and feed, but there's no wind, and so even if the fish are up shallow, they're going to be really spooky and hard to catch. So what I did is I actually made an audible at 11:30, and I ran down out of this creek, out of Beaver, and ran down. And you can see right here the water's super muddy. And this is kind of what it looks like right now on Beaver because of all the rain we've had. And so you have this clear water over here, and then you have the muddy water in here. I actually ran over to this pocket right here, and I just started on this bluff, steep bluff wall at this point, and I fished down through here with a jerk bait, didn't get any bites. Water visibility was like a foot and a half to two foot of visibility. Uh, water temps were 44, 43, 44 degrees, so cold water temps. But it was warming up because of that warm sun that we had beating on the bank and it was warm the day before and so this water was warming up because of the sun there was no wind it was slick calm but because of that muddy water those fish were more likely to be able to chase my bait and bite the bait and so i pulled around this point fishing a sartre shad color jerk bait and caught a keeper spot 13 inch or nothing crazy and worked down and actually ran over here to this point and boom caught a two and a quarter two and a half pound largemouth first stop so i mean i literally ran from here, 
all the way down the lake to here just to get to this dirtier water. And in my first spot, I caught two keepers back to back. And I hadn't caught a fish in three hours fishing in this part of the lake. And so, again, it's all about adjustments like that. You can't really ever say that the top end of the lake is better than the lower end is better than the middle part of the lake. It just depends on the conditions. But overall, it's easier to catch fish in like the the part of the lake where it's not super clear, but it's not super muddy. So like this part of the lake right here has two to three, maybe three and a half feet of visibility. And that's a really good for the winter because that water doesn't cool down super fast, but those fish are still active in two to three foot of visibility, even when there's not too much wind. There can just be a light wind and they can still uh, get after it. So that's uh, my answer to that question. That was a very long-winded response. Um, JT saying, Johnny, the mastermind. Um, Tim saying, I appreciate George Lakes, man. I've learned a lot from watching YouTube channel too. Keep the lines wet and see you next week. Thank you. Uh, Tim, appreciate that. Let's see here. Enjoy your passion you have for Chase and after them. That's Shane Hernandez. Thanks, man. Um, <laughs> Cliff, Clifford saying, while I'm late, what's up, JT? Uh, good to see you, Clifford. How's it going, man? Um, how do I get a topo map for a private lake? So that's Hans. Hans, when you're looking for uh, contour lines on a private lake, the best thing you can do is actually do the auto chart live, which is a software that can actually chart the lake for you. You have to buy a specific graph for it, which is like, I think you need a hummingbird helix or an onyx or some of the Lawrence units have them and you can actually drive through your lake and make a map yourself that's the only way that i know to do it um there's no other way to make the the, the contour line maps for your lake so I've done it before on a couple different lakes and I found some amazing stuff, lakes that have no contour lines but I'm also about to make a video on how to graph a lake that has no contour lines and how to find fish. So it's a lake that has no contour lines at all. I actually go into a lake I've never been to. That's my plan for this weekend. I might do the uh, the video game fishing video now instead of that one. Uh, I might actually put a little poll up on my uh, chat to see video game fishing video or how to fish, how to find offshore fish on a lake without contour lines. Those are the two videos I wanted to make, or the one video I wanted to make this weekend. So I'm going to make a poll on my YouTube community page on the app on my phone. So go over to um, this right here on the phone, on your phone, the YouTube app, and check out that poll and vote for which video I'm going to make this weekend. So uh, we'll see which one wins out there, and then I'll make the other one the next weekend, but it'll just be whichever one comes first. Um, let's see here. Whoa, so many skipped very far. One second, guys. Um, let's, see. let's see here. Just a bunch of people. Samuel Wilson said, watch all your videos. Uh, thanks for taking the time You're not uh, to share your knowledge and explaining with Naviax. Keep up the awesome videos. Thanks, Samuel. Appreciate that. Um, let's see here. I work right. Uh, William Witt says, I work right by Foosh Creek. Need to pull my boat to work one day and try. Uh, it's definitely worth a shot. It's a lot better in the spring and in the summer. Foosh Creek is really good. I caught some good fish in there over the years. Um, Mike Emberson says, uh, he wants to see Uchi. Uh, I could definitely do a Uchi video. I have a Uchi video. It's, it's actually the video I made. It's the complete guide to bass fishing or ledge fishing, the complete guide to summer ledge fishing. That video is filmed on Uchi Lake in Oklahoma. And that's where I caught all those fish. And so if you want to check out a video on how to catch summer bass on Uchi, go check that video out. Uh, I have a lot of spots in there, uh, showing I love that lake. That lake is so good. I don't fish out there in the winter though that much. I need, maybe need to take a uh, take a trip down there. Fishing for you. Can you do a lake called Heiko Lake in North Carolina? I'm fishing late February. I actually did a lake breakdown for my Patreon on Heiko Lake. Um, and uh, I can, if you join, you have to, so basically the way I'm doing this, guys, I would love to take every request and just say I can do every lake in the comments here. The big thing is I try to, uh, let my Patreon people get first crack at the lake suggestions. So uh, if you go over to my Patreon page, uh, people who support the channel get a chance to have their lake looked at on this live stream. And then you also get notified when I open up new personal uh, fishing lesson spots, guided fishing trips, um, the lake breakdown where I do a, a map of uh, a lake. And so I can actually show you kind of what one of those um, – 
looks like here for a second, just for those who are interested. Let me um, let me pull one up just to show you guys what you could be getting. Um, let's see here. One second. I need to pull this. Just give me half a second. I just want to show you guys this. Try to pull one up. Bear with me, guys. This is probably not the best thing to be doing on a live stream trying to find this. Just give me... <laughs> Okay, um, I'm having a lot of troubles with this. Give me a couple more seconds. Really sorry about this, guys. Didn't have any of this planned out, but we're getting there. I had to download it from another place. Here we go. Okay, so here is a like, breakdown for you. Let me share my screen. I'm getting, seeing, hopefully people aren't dropping too much like flies. Um, pull this over. And then this. And boom. Okay. So here's a like breakdown. Here's one I did for a guy um, uh, who subscribed to my Patreon, $20 Patreon subscriber. So basically I'll break down your lake. I'll look at four or five areas on your lake and I'll show, you know, spots I think, lure recommendations, where I think you should fish, best conditions of fish, uh, location descriptions, mark up a bunch of different spots, you know, where I think you should go, um, you know, areas based on time of year, conditions, all that stuff, best conditions of fish. I'll do it by different seasons, things like that. And uh, that's on my Patreon page. I don't have any spots open left for this, unfortunately. Um, basically, what I do with that is I uh, only have a limited time in my schedule to actually make these lake breakdowns, uh, just because I'm working full time. But hopefully, in the future, if I you know get a bunch of support, get a bunch of people joining Patreon, get a bunch bunch of people uh, subscribing to the channel, I might be able to do this even more um, as it goes forward. And so I might be able to you know beef it up to get to doing, I'm doing like 10 a month right now. If I can beef, I might be able to beef it up to doing 40 a month. Who knows um, if I can do it in the future, but they just take a long time for each of them. You guys can imagine. So uh, just something that I like to do for you guys. It's really fun to be able to get that information out to you. It's fun to share all this great data and share those maps. So uh, anyways, if you guys want uh, to get a first dibs at potentially getting one of those spots to get one of those like breakdowns, again, go over here into the Patreon page using the link in the bottom right corner. But uh, anyways, that's that. And then let's see here. Trying to go through here. Let's see here. Okay. Um, bunch of people already going through. I don't know what's going on in the comments. There's a bunch of stuff going on. Um, let's see here. Devin's talking about Major League Fishing. Trying to get through the comments, guys. Let's see here. I'm sorry, YouTube channel. Garrett Albert. Good luck, man. Um, CC says Major League Fishing was boring today. I actually didn't watch it. Was it? How, how what would you guys think about that? Did you think Major League Fishing was good? Like, did they catch a lot of fish? How was the camera? Like, it was live. I don't know. Was it good to? Um, was it good to watch? I'm really interested to see what it's like because I know that they're making a big bet on it. All these pros jump ship to Major League Fishing, so I'm wondering if that's actually interesting to watch. But uh, anyways, I don't see too many more comments coming in. We've kind of slowed down um, on what people are commenting. So I think I'm probably going to wrap up the stream here. It's an hour and a half, 170 people still on, which is awesome, guys. So anyways, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the stream. Hope you enjoyed the first half, which was – or the first – Two thirds, which was focused on how to find winter bass, and then hope you enjoyed the Q and A as well. And uh, people are saying it's boring uh, and it's not uh, as as good. For live coverage was freezing all day. Um, could answer some questions or give some tips for fishing this time of year. Um, Caleb Bass and Kid TV. Uh, 
I mean, as far as fishing this time of year, check out my live streams. I have a bunch of live streams out where I talk all kinds of stuff about fishing this time of year. The ha first half of the stream was all about it. Plus, I have a, the video on winter jig fishing. That's a great video for talking about that. Plus, all my other YouTube videos in the past give you all the patterns I use to catch big fish. So check all that stuff out. A ton of great resources. There's a page, uh, playlist on my page of, with all my winter fishing videos. And those give my best patterns that I use to catch my biggest fish. So anyways, um, just uh, Fishing for You says, do your fish tournaments? I used to. Uh, I won... I think five junior state tournaments uh, finish in the top 10 in the high school fishing world finals. Every year I fish in high school, I finished second, third, fifth, seventh, and 10th in that. And then I fished over 150 tournaments in my life. So tons of tournaments. I want to get back into it, but that's kind of what um, you know, I used to do. I used to fish tons of junior tournaments, tons of college tournaments, all that stuff. Won some college regional tournaments, stuff like that. But um, not anymore. But I want to get back into it. I'll probably get my butt kicked when I first get back into um, anything. And then uh, Caleb Baskin says, thanks for answering my comment. It means a lot. I'm a huge fan of the channel. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Um, and JT saying so many questions for the man. Thanks for being my moderator, JT. Uh, you're always getting my back when I miss comments. Uh, it's good to have some people in here helping me out. Uh, enjoy the content. How much do you, uh, do you get to come to Virginia uh, and fish for two days and do a personal breakdown? Josh Ingram. Uh, traveling is pretty tough for me right now just because of the working full time. But I, if I, you know, in the future might be traveling more, uh, might be able to make like a tour of the country. Who knows? Um, just depends on where the channel goes, the support I get, sponsors, all that stuff. You know, if you never know how, you know, the live stream and everything or how the, the fishing stuff's going to turn out. But, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. And then, um, let's see here. Best pre-spawn swim bait. Do you ever fish big swim baits? I don't fish swim baits too much. I love to fish an Alabama rig and I like to fish like a single swim bait, like a Shadlicious or a Bass Tricks, like big paddle tail. Also fish like a Kitex swim bait, stuff like that. But I don't really ever fish any of the really big swim baits, like the Depths or the River to Sea uh, wave or S wave or stuff like that. I wanted to start doing that more. Um, especially now that I'm up here around like Table Rock, Beaver Lake, but I haven't done it, uh, in the past. So, and then, uh, Jay Sparrow says there are negative comments, not cool. I don't actually see any negative comments. Uh, I don't know if some of the videos got detracted. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. I think it's people trying to pump their, their channels. So other than that, uh, I think everyone's pretty positive here, right? I don't know. You guys are pretty awesome fans. You guys are actually awesome. Uh, always keeping it positive and, uh, you know, always helping, um, you know, help me out in the comments. You know, if I mess up, you guys don't beat me up too bad. So always appreciate that. You guys are awesome fans and, you know, awesome guys to talk fishing with every week. So I'd love to meet more of you guys. Love to do more meetups, all kinds of stuff. It's, uh, you know, just talk fishing. I love it. It's my passion. It's what I love to do. And I know you guys love to do it too. So uh, it takes a certain type of person, a certain type of fisherman to sit and listen to a guy talk about Navionics for an hour every Tuesday night. But that's my kind of uh, people. So anyways, uh, I'm probably going to close up from that, guys. Hour and 30 minutes in. But uh, hope you guys enjoy um, the uh, the content. Enjoy the live stream. Enjoy all the videos. Thank again for all the support. And I'll see you guys next week for another Fish in the Moment live stream.